I'm going to keep reading. We're getting closer to the end. Um, one of the last things I read. Oh, yes. One of the last things I read, uh, Millie decided to bring Alice to her tribe. And Alice is going to be meeting Millie's entire family. So. Uh, now we're going to see how Alice, is, how Alice feels about meeting Millie's family, and that's where I'm going to pick up. Alice felt a glow inside of her, like she'd swallowed a spoonful of sunshine. Even if this all goes wrong, she thought, at least I will have had this. At least I will have had a friend. She stepped forward, head back, shoulders squared, feeling braver than she ever had, ready to explain the plan that she and Millie had made. But as soon as she opened her mouth, Maximus's big hands grasped her shoulders. Wait, he said, I will gather the tribe. A few minutes later, two dozen year, giant and hulking and covered in fur, were gathered in a circle. Maximus held a tall staff, the speaking stick, Millie had told her. Alice tried not to stare. She could feel their eyes on her, their gazes ranging from curious to distrustful to hostile. Fear twisted in her belly. They were all so big and braided with the pity she felt for them. She knew what it was like to want to be invisible. She couldn't imagine, though, what it would be like if you had to hide and disguise yourself all the time because being seen meant danger or death. She looked at Millie, who nodded. She's my friend, Alice thought. I have to try. This is Alice the Nofer, Maximus began. Will you hear her now? We will hear, the year murmured, some more reluctantly than others. Alice took one step forward, then another, and when Maximus handed her the staff, she wrapped her hand around it and leaned forward, letting it take her weight. The year watched, barely making a sound, each of their faces grave and intent. <sighs> My name is Alice Mayfair. Alice said. I am a learner, a student, at the school across the lake. I'm sorry I got you in trouble, but Millie and I think that we have a way to help. She paused, gulped a breath of air, and squeezed the speaking stick hard with both hands so that no one would see her tremble. The year were looking at her, examining her more carefully than even Felicia and her fancy ladies who lunch, fancy ladies who lunch friends ever had. But instead of looking to see whatever sh whether she was dressed appropriately, whether her shoes were scuffed or her hair was tangled, they were looking to see if she was dangerous, if she had a gun, if she was going to hurt them. Alice felt another surge of sympathy as she thought of how lonely and afraid they all must be, just as the youngest one, Flory, she thought, raced forward and touched her hand. Flory! The little year's mother hissed and yanked her daughter backward in an agony of shame and fear. Flory giggled. She's all bare, she said, all bare and nakedy. Flory! The air was tugging at her daughter's ear with one hand and covering her own eyes in embarrassment, Alice thought, with the other. How did you find us? Old Aunt Yetta asked in her cracked and screechy voice. I know how, growled Ricardin. It's that Millie, always having the curiosity, always asking the questions about the Nofers, always singing. He made the word singing sound like murdering innocent kittens. It's not Millie's fault. When all the year flinched, Alice lowered her voice. Millie just wants to be who she is. It's not her fault she wanted to find people to be with, people who can appreciate her. She lifted her head and said, I think I know how to fix this, but I need Millie's help. I need her to come with me across the lake. For an endless minute, the tribe just stared. No, Septima whispered. She was shaking so hard that Alice could see her fur tremble. She pulled Millie back against her body and held her daughter tight. No, I won't have it. I won't risk her. She is my only cub, the only one I'll ever have, and I won't let her be hurt. She turned to the rest of the tribe, her hair disarranged, her eyes wild. We can go. We can go now. If we leave, leave our things behind. If we're being fast and quiet, they might not be able to catch us. Don't I have a choice in this? Millie slipped out of her mother's grasp. She snatched the speaking stick. I am Melodia of the year. Would you hear me? For a moment, the tribe just stared. We will hear, 
Maximus finally said, even though littlies were never allowed to speak at tribe meetings. Milly gave the speaking stick to Alice and turned to face both her parents, hands out in appeal. If you raise me rightly, then I decide the right thing. And what I decide is to help my tribe. There was silence. Alice held her breath. Finally, Maximus gave a single nod. We will go to the tunnel for now. We will hide, he said. Do what you can, Alice of the Nofer. And Millie, he crouched down until he could look his little daughter in right in the eye. I believe in you, he said. Millie nodded, then she looked at Alice, indicating her fur. Should I be disguising myself? No, Alice said, and almost smiled, remembering the Experimental Center for Love and Learning's motto, the one spelled out on its website on its every piece of mail that it sent, where every child is special. Keep your fur. I want you just the way you are. She stood up straight, shoulders back, hair slipping free from the braid, and, the, and let the air look at her, examining her from the top of her head to the tips of her toes as she explained what she had in mind. Two hours later, Alice knocked on the entrance to Phil and Lori's office. Before they could invite her in, before she could lose the nerve and run away, she pushed the door open and pulled Millie inside. Lori's mouth dropped when she stared at Millie, whose furry face and arms and legs were left bare by her blue dress. Phil's car fell to the ground with an unlovely jangle. Alice couldn't help but be amused. They said they celebrated difference, but when they saw someone who was actually, genuinely not like them, they were just as scared as everyone else. As she told the story that she and Millie had put together on their paddle across the lake, Phil tugged at his beard and Lori closed her mouth and pulled her reading glasses out of her needlepoint purse, purchased, she told her learners, on a trip to Guatemala and sewn an indigenous craftswoman who were paid a living wage. Explain that all again, Lori finally said. Start from the beginning. This is my cousin Millie, Alice began, feeling a prickle of unease as she wondered how much time they had until the rally began. She's got a genetic condition. Phileas lupus. Pileus lupus, Millie said. She and Alice had consulted an English to Latin dictionary on Alice's phone on their way to the office. Basically, it means I'm, well, you can see for yourself. My goodness, Lori murmured. Millie's parents were visiting Standish, Alice said. They were thinking about bringing Millie to look at the center after I told them about it. So far, she's just been homeschooled. My aunt and uncle tried public school and then private school, but you can guess how that went. Children could be so cruel, Millie murmured with an exaggeration, ex with an exaggerated expression of sorrow. Lori made a cooing noise and Phil's face became stern. Alice could tell that, even in the midst of everything, Millie was enjoying her chance to interact with the Nofers. Not just to meet them, she thought, but to perform for them. Not at the experimental center, Phil said. We don't tolerate intolerance. That's what I told Uncle Max and Aunt Septi, Alice said. They didn't want to let Millie even come for a visit, but I told them how you guys were and how you made me feel and how great you were about the whole, you know, the whole thing that happened to me. I said, this is a place where any kid can feel safe and happy and free to be herself. This was the longest speech Alice had made to anyone at the center, and she felt breathless when it was done. Phil clasped his hands against his heart, trapping his beard against his chest. Lori's eyes were glistening. Alice, she said, I can't tell you how much it means to hear you say that and how much we value your faith in our community. We'll take good care of Millie. Don't worry about a thing. Alice and Millie nodded, and when Lori and Phil weren't looking, Alice gave Millie a wink. One other thing, Alice said. On Halloween, Millie came trick-or-treating with me, and when we were in Standish, some kids in town saw her. They were staring and pointing, and I heard them say something about how she looked like a Bigfoot and how they should bring their friends to the old campsite tonight to look at the freak. Phil's face hardened and Lori's lips thinned. Alice saw, that, saw the look they exchanged. She knew they'd been contacted by the paper and guessed they must have heard and read about the rally that night. Alice, you should have made sure we knew about Millie before you went trick-or-treating with her, Lori said. But we won't worry about that right now. For now, Lori Belt bent down to sweep Millie into a hug that squished Millie's face against Lori's bosom. Don't you worry about anything. We will keep you safe. You really think this will work? Millie asked as she followed Alice toward Bunk Ladybug. We have to try, said Alice. We didn't know if it would last. 
but for now, all her nervousness and self-consciousness had magically disappeared, and left behind was a sense of resolve and courage. When she opened the door, Raya was in the corner watching the 1988 Olympic fencing matches on her phone. Haley was in the bathroom with her replacement neti pot. Jessica was standing in front of the full-length three-way mirror she'd installed on the closet door considering her outfit. A short skirt and crop top from three different angles. Hi guys, said Alice. Raya put her phone down. Haley looked over her shoulder with her steaming neti pot in her hand. Even Jessica stopped primping. Alice realized that in almost 10 weeks of school, she couldn't remember a single time where she'd been the one to say hello to her bunkmate first. You remember Millie? The three of them looked at Alice's fur-covered friend. You're still wearing your costume, Taylor finally said. I don't think it's a costume, said Raya. Jessica sniffed and muttered something that sounded like freak. Alice glared at her. Raya, you're right. Millie's fur wasn't really a costume. She has a rare medical condition and she doesn't like people staring at her. She paused to give Jessica a dirty look. Or making her feel different because of things that aren't her fault. Halloween's the only day of the year that she even goes out in public. Only now, Alice continued, some people from town saw her and they're chasing her and trying to take her picture. Why do they want to do that? asked Taylor, reaching for a handkerchief. To put her picture online, said Alice, still giving Jessica a hard look. To embarrass her and try to make her feel like she doesn't matter. Jessica rolled her eyes. Millie gave Jessica a long and careful look, then bared her teeth and gave a very soft hiss. Jessica flinched. Excuse me, she needs our help, said Alice. It's not her fault she's got... She stopped herself before she said the word fur. Hair. Isn't it catching? It isn't catching, and she isn't dangerous. She won't hurt anyone. She's my only friend. My only friend. Alice closed her mouth. Raya was still staring. From the bathroom, Taylor sniffed. Then she asked, aren't we your friends too? Alice blinked. She knew that Jessica hated her. She had assumed that everyone else in seventh grade, possibly everyone else at the center too, did too, and that Raya and Taylor only put up with her because they had to. I, I guess. We want to be your friends, Raya said, but you don't seem like you like us very much. You leave in the mornings and don't, and you, you leave in the mornings and you won't tell anyone where you, where you go, said Taylor. Then she sneezed three times in a row. Millie looked alarmed. I have allergies, Taylor explained. Dust, pollen, pet dander. Why don't you just tell her that you're not a why don't you just tell her what you're not allergic to? That'd probably take less time, Jessica said, lifting her chin in the air. Millie turned toward Jessica. Nay, yay, she said. I know what you are. Her voice was very soft, but Alice could hear the dislike inside of her, like a fist inside the pocket of a fancy fur coat. She thought that Jessica heard it too, because again, she flinched and gave her hair a toss. I'm out of here, she said. Raya jumped up and stood in front of her. No, Raya said. You're not. You owe Alice. I owe Alice what? Jessica's expression was scornful. Her glossy, her glossy lips curled in disdain, but Alice could hear the faintest tremble in her voice. It's not my fault she actually thought normal kids would want to be friends with. There was a tiny pause. Alice saw Jessica's gaze slide toward Millie, who had her hands folded over her chest and whose fur seemed to be bristling. With someone like her, she concluded. Normal kids? Millie repeated. Jessica attempted another head toss, but this one was far less emphatic. As she bumped her hip on the corner of the bunk bed and almost tripped on her way to the door. In a flash, Raya was there, foil in her hand, standing between Jessica and Freedom. Oh, no, you don't, she said. Oh, yes, I do, furry, Jessica sneered. Raya lifted her sword. Jessica cringed and then, and then said, Get out of my way or I'll tell Lori and Phil that you've got a weapon in here. She's allowed to have it, said Taylor. She's got special permission, which you would know, she continued, if you didn't ignore us all the time. Great, Jessica murmured. And now Alice was positive that her nemesis looked afraid. I'm not helping her, Jessica said. I don't want any part of this. Oh, you don't have to do anything, said Millie in a silky, somehow dangerous voice. She smiled in a way that Alice had never seen her smile before, a grin that displayed all of her very white, sharp-looking teeth, then repeated a line that Alice had used. Just be yourself, she said. All right, I'm going to stop there. 
We're going to pick up tomorrow and we're going to hear from Jeremy and what he has to say about everything. So stay tuned for that.